This is the day that the Lord hath made, and I will rejoice. Please join me and be glad in it. Minister Van Bynum told us the other day that rather than saying it's a good day, it's a God day. It's a God day because God is the creator of all things. We will rejoice and be glad in this God day. I'm Bishop Marcus A. Johnson Sr. I am your host today on the New Harvest Midday Inspirational Meal Time. And I am just delighted for us to continue on in our study as we're closing out on our study of the book of Acts. It has been a rich, rich experience that we have been engaged in for now for a couple of months. And we just thank God for it. Let's pray now and ask God's blessings. Father, we thank you for this spiritual meal that you have prepared for us in your word. We thank you that your word is the bread of life and that it gives us what we need in order to conquer every challenge that the enemy places before us. Thank you, God, for allowing us to have spiritual energy to be able to walk in victory. Now bless everyone under the sound of my voice, every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, every individual, no matter what the struggle is, bless and then, oh God, release your favor. Oh God, as you not only give dreams, you answer those dreams. You not only give visions, but you fulfill them. Grant it, God, for the sake of your people in service in the kingdom of God. We thank you for the truth. We thank you for the eternal life and light that yet shines. We give you the glory and thanks again for this meal. In Jesus' name, amen. I pronounce blessings upon each of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Those that are hungry and yearning for God's word. I'm not just talking about, I'm not talking about people that are perfect. I'm talking about people that trust a perfect God, a God who loves us from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. That's the God we serve. He cares about us. Details, little things. That may not be important to other people, but because it concerneth us, then it matters to God. And if we make God priority in our lives, then God will fulfill in us what only God can do, and that is to make us whole. And so we thank God for this and all that he is doing. And so we continue on in this study. All year we've been talking about heritage and legacy, walking through. And so our series in the book of Acts, which is all about the action or the activity of the Holy Spirit through his church. Holy Spirit as heritage, empowering the church as legacy. Our study today is Acts chapter 24, and we're entitling it Paul Standing Before Governor Felix. Paul Standing Before Governor Felix. Who are the main characters? Well, Paul, the centurion, Ananias, the high priest, elders, Tertullus, who is also a lawyer, Governor Felix, Drusilla, the wife of Governor Felix, and Portius Festus. So let's begin our study. Here we go. And so I know you're taking your notes and the notes that appear, you're grabbing those. This is a rich, 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 comprehensive overview in the study of Acts. Acts 24, verse 1 through 6, and I read, And after five days, Ananias, the high priest, descended with the elders and with a certain orator or lawyer named Tertullus, who informed the governor against Paul. And when he was called forth, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Seeing that by thee we enjoy great quietness. Now, what well, he's trying to impress the governor now. By thee, O governor Festus, Felix, we, we enjoy great quietness. And that very worthy deeds are done unto this nation by the providence. We accept it always and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness. Do you hear how he's trying to, you know, impress the governor? This is the lawyer talking now on behalf of the high priest, the elders. And so he has great oration. 
And so he's kind of pontificating, if you will, giving this fantastic introduction. Verse 4, notwithstanding that I be not further tedious unto thee, I pray thee, pray thee that thou wouldest hear us of the clemency a few words. Give us indulgence, O governor, and hear what we have to say. For we have found this man, Paul, a pestilent fellow and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes who also have gone about to profane the temple whom we took and would have judged according to our law. So what is he saying? He is saying, after I have flowered you with all these wonderful things and words and, and tried to really speak well of you, we're really here because Paul is a problem, because Paul has created all of these issues, and he is seditious, and he's causing confusion everywhere, and, and, and that he is the lead man of the Nazarenes. Why did they say Nazarenes? Well, they said Nazarenes because they didn't want to call them Christians because they didn't want to say Christ. So Jesus was from Nazareth. So they called the people of the way or the followers Nazarenes because that was the closest they could come to saying the people that follow Jesus without calling Christ, without being any more specific. And believe me, the governor knew what they were talking about. Highlight number one, Paul standing before Governor Felix as Ananias, the high priest, elders, and lawyer Tertullus falsely accused him, Paul, of upsetting the Jewish world, being the ringleader of seditious Christians called Nazarenes. That's what was taking place now. We can see Paul is being moved from one place, from one group, and a mob of Jews, then before the Sanhedrins. Now he's be before the governor Felix. Oh, God is working this thing out. He's being moved to the ultimate destiny. Acts 17, verse 5 through 6. But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. So we see that they have always been those that would create commotion, that were opposing the movement of the early church. We're reading this in Acts 17. And it's the same thing happening in our lesson today, Acts 25, Acts 17, verse 6. And when they found them not, when they couldn't find the apostles, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, these that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. It's the same spirit, the same demonic spirit that has operated throughout the church age to try to stop and thwart the work of God. But I'm here to tell you, if God be for you, who can be against you? Nobody can stop the work of God. It is unstoppable. Jane, uh, insight, insight number one. Whereas the accusing Jews lied and plotted against Paul, continuously instigating turmoil, falsely accused Paul of the same on the grounds of protecting their religious traditions. So the ones that were creating the problem accused Paul of creating the problem. Can you imagine? They accused Paul of doing what they were doing. They were instigating the commotion. James 1, 26 to 27. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself, here it is, unspotted from the world. Well, these religious leaders were spotted. These religious leaders were defiled. And so they were not practicing pure religion. They were practicing their own hidden self agenda. Tip number one, let's be clear that rejecting the gospel's truths corrupts the heart and subverts all motives. 
because they were rejecting the message of Jesus, because they were rejecting the word of God, because they were rejecting God's invitation through hearing the gospel, hearing the word preach and deliver it, then they were having their hearts corrupted and their motives were all subverted. They were underhanded. Romans 1, 18 through 22 kind of walks us through this. Listen to this. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead. Every man, woman, boy, and girl, deep down within, there is that innate awareness that there is a God. It's there. So that they are without excuse because that when they knew God, meaning they were aware of the reality of God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. And their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise. They became fools. So we're reading in our lesson today a whole group of people that have become foolish. Foolish, why? Because they're rejecting truth. Acts 24, verse 10 through 21. Then Paul, after that the governor had beckoned unto him to speak, answered, for as much as I know that thou hast been of many years a judge unto this nation, Paul's acknowledging the role that Festus has played, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. So now my accusers have spoken concerning me. Now let me speak for myself. Because that thou mayest understand that there are yet but 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem for to worship. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, neither in the synagogues, nor in the city. Somebody better hit that like button because Paul is just rehearsing and telling the truth back and you need to rejoice when the truth is being told. Neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. For this I confess unto thee. I like the way he said what they're saying is not true, but let me just say this. This part is true. After the way which they call heresy, meaning after they have seen my worship of Christianity, because that's called the way. And it is the way because Jesus said, I am the way. So it's the people that's following Jesus, the people of the way. So he says, but this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. I believe the law and the prophets just like they say they do. I believe it also and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow. He's talking about the Pharisees, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. So what Paul is saying, I'm showing you the similarities of what we believe. And though they're accusing me of violation of the law, I am a believer in the law, but also I am a believer of our hope of the resurrection of the dead. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void to offense towards God and towards men. And though they're accusing me of having done wrong, I have a conscience to do that which is right under God and even towards men. Now, after many years, I came to bring alms to my nations. He says, I'm here because I am bringing contributions. I'm bringing money to those that are in need, to those Jews, my people, that are in need. And I'm bringing them offerings, which means now that Governor Festus knows that Paul has money. Whereupon certain Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with multitude nor with tumult. So the things they're accusing me of, when they found me, I was not guilty of those things in the synagogue. 
and they say I desecrate the synagogue. They didn't find me in there desecrating it, not not by one shred. I was involved in a in, in a ceremony of purification among other Jews, who ought to have been there before thee, and object if I was doing something wrong. Then they they should have said something way back then if they had ought against me. Or else let these same here say, if they have found any evil doing in me while I stood before the council. So they've had an opportunity to make the allegation and to back it up with examples, with details of witness. He says, he's implying they can't do it. Except it be for this one voice. Here's the only thing they can accuse me of that I agree. Here it is. That I cried standing among them, touching the resurrection of the dead. I am called in question by you this day. So I will acknowledge before you, yes, I have taught about the resurrection of the dead. Highlight number two. Boy, that's some good stuff. Paul standing before Governor Felix refuted all false allegations, reiterating his compliance with witnesses of the Jewish laws in the synagogue as he brings charitable gifts to his brethren in need. 1 Peter 3.16 Paul, Peter speaks concerning the sentiment of Paul here. This is what Peter says, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evil doers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Let the record show that though they make accusation, they're lying. Let the record show that I stand with a good conscience that I am about my father's work. Insight number two. Insight number two. Whereas false accusations were made against Paul, he disclosed the heart of these allegations was all about his teaching the resurrection from the dead, founded upon Jesus the Messiah and the resurrected Lord. So he is acknowledging that's what their real issue is. The only other thing he didn't mention was that he was reaching out to Gentiles. But the reality was they had an issue with Paul preaching Jesus, the resurrected Lord, because they, they, they had him killed. They wanted to get rid of him. And how dare you come and say he's raised from the dead, which simply means he yet liveth, he's alive. And all of our efforts to get rid of Jesus and his teachings still remains. So Paul is saying, that's what their issue is, that I'm teaching the resurrection of the dead, that Jesus is the Messiah and the resurrected Lord. Acts 2.36, Peter preached this on Pentecost. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, let all the Jews know, that God hath made the same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. That was Peter's message on the day of Pentecost, and that's what Paul is teaching and what Paul is now defending. Tip number two. Tip number two. Let's be clear. The gospel's good news beyond Jesus dying for our sins is he has conquered death for believers being raised from the dead. That's what makes our faith different from all other faiths, all other denominations, all other religions. None teach that their Lord died and is raised from the dead and lives forever. None teach that, but, but Christianity, because it's founded on the resurrected Lord. He is alive forevermore. Revelations 1.18, John said this when he was on the Isle called Patmos and he had this encounter with God. I am he that liveth, Jesus said to him, to John, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Amen means it is so. And so therefore, Paul was saying, 
Their issue is that I'm preaching and teaching Jesus Christ, the resurrected Messiah and Lord. That's their issue. Oh, hallelujah. But I'm so glad their issue doesn't stop my truth. Praise be to God. Somebody say hallelujah. Hit that like button, please. Please hit the like button. We want the world to know that Jesus Christ yet liveth. He is alive forevermore. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Praise God. Acts 24, verse 22 to 27. And when Felix, the governor now, heard these things, having more perfect knowledge of that way, he was aware of the people of the way or of the Christians. He was aware of that. He deferred them and said, when Lysias, the chief captain, shall come down, I will know the uttermost of your matter. So he said, let's end this hearing right here. And when the commander that had you sent here, when he comes down, then I will tell you what my decision is. And he commanded a centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty, to have him in prison, to, to arrest him, and that he should forbid none of his acquaintance to minister or come unto him. So I want you to arrest him, but don't restrict him and allow him to have visitors. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, which was a Jewish, so she was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Governor Felix says, okay, Governor Felix, he says, all right, let, 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 let me hear Paul again. I want to hear him talk about his faith. He sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he reasoned of righteousness, this is what Paul talked about, righteousness and temperance and judgment to come. So now these things Felix was interested in, but here's the issue. Paul then said, and you're going to give an accountability to God because he's going to judge all souls. Felix trembled and answered, go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. It was getting to him. So he says, okay, you go away. And when I have some free time, I'll call upon you. So <laughs> it's obvious he wanted more, but he couldn't take it. Verse 26, he hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul, that he might lose him. So he was also hoping every time I call Paul before me, that Paul would want to pay me off. Wherefore, he sent for him the oftener and communed with him so he could pay him off. So he had some things going on in him. But after two years, Portius Festus came into Felix's room and Felix, Governor Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. So Paul, for two years, was on arrest. With freedom, he could have visitors come and go. They could bring him things. They could minister to him. All this drama going on. Why? Because he wanted to appease the Jews. And yet, he wanted Paul to give him something, something. Highlight number three. Highlight number three, Paul standing before Governor Felix, eventually in the presence of Lysias the captain, knowing Paul was innocent, ordered his imprisonment with freedoms and non-restrictive visitations. Luke 23, 13 through 14, we see where this same thing happened with Jesus. Same thing. The innocence is known. And by the way, somebody is falsely accusing you, for the most part, individuals know you are innocent. So don't you worry about that. As long as God knows, God knows how to cover his own. And Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers of the people, the rulers and the people, said unto them, Ye have brought this man, talking about Jesus, unto me, as one that perverteth the people, and behold, I have examined him before you and have found no fault in this man touching those things whereof you accuse him. No, 
nor yet Herod, for I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. Listen to this. Pilate was saying, neither Herod nor I can find anything he's guilty of punishable by death. Yes, you brought him to me, but you know the saying, but I find no fault in him. Hallelujah. How many of you can say, I find no fault in him? He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. How can Jesus be uh, have a fault when he is sinless? Insight number three, whereas Governor Festus, I'm sorry, Governor Felix, with his wife, Drusilla, make sure I, I'm, I'm giving the right names. That's right. Right. Whereas Governor Felix, let me correct that in my notes because I put it in here wrong. Whereas Governor Felix, with his wife, Drusilla, having Paul imprisoned, often questioned him about his faith, though not releasing him to appease the Jews and await a bribery payment for his release. That was the underlining motive. Luke 23, 15, we read it before, I'll read it again. Concerning Jesus, Pilate said, No, nor yet Herod, for I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of him, nothing worthy of death is done unto him, because he is innocent. Tip number three. Tip number three. Let's be clear. Despite Paul's unjust imprisonment, God was divinely moving him closer towards his destiny assignment to go to Rome. Listen, uh, Paul was in prison there, and in this text, two years. But if the Jews had had their way, they would have killed him. He would have been dead. Why was he still living? Because destiny required that Paul get to Rome. So I want to make a statement right now. Somebody is worried about whether you're going to make it, whether you're going to overcome, whether you're going to survive. Can I just tell you this? If you operate in the will of God, you have to live to fulfill your destiny. And God will send angels of mercy. God will release his grace to keep his hand over you, to protect you despite opposition until you arrive at your destiny. I want somebody to say, I'm going to live to arrive at my destiny. We've been talking about airborne and planes flying and taking off and landing and cruising. Well, I'm here to tell you the reason why I boarded the plane was to arrive at my destiny. And yes, when I get there, I'm going through customs. Why am I going through customs? Because I've got things to hear. I've got things to see. And I've got things to speak. And I've got things to learn, to be aware of. I need to have a God encounter. I can't go down without having that ultimate experience of God in the earth realm. And I'll do it while I'm living in my physical, while I take a spiritual flight. Philippians 1 and 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father, we thank you now that just like you kept Paul until he accomplished the fulfillment of prophecy, that he would speak before kings and before men, and that he would go to great lands before those of great importance, that he would speak and represent the kingdom. And you kept him in the earth realm until he could say, I finished the course. Now bless us, O oh God, with a determination not to quit, but to keep on going. And we trust you in this, our journey. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Heaven smile upon you. This has been wonderful. Now you want to tune in tomorrow because tomorrow is roll call and you don't want to miss that. And then we will continue on in our study. We'll pick up on uh, Acts chapter 25 and continue on. God bless you.
please, please hit the like button. That's your way of helping our evangelistic effort to get out. God bless you in Jesus' name.